Welcome to an episode of Beyond the Bench, a podcast series produced by the Florida Supreme Court. These podcasts will give you a better understanding of how Florida's courts work and how they work for you. Hello, I'm Florida Chief Justice George LaBarga. I am here with Leon County Judge Nina Ashanafi Richardson, and we're going to be talking about how Florida courts communicate and why that communication is so important to our system of justice and a lot of other great things like a functioning democracy in a civil society. We're both very happy you joined us today, Judge Ashanafi. Hello, Chief. Thank you for asking me to be part of this podcast. I'm so excited to be here and to be talking about court communications. That's something I've spent a good deal of time thinking about and talking about in the last year or so. If there's any time that we need to be communicating with our citizens about the courts, the importance of what the courts do, the importance of an independent judiciary, the importance of the rule of law, it is now. Because we have so much, so much social media that allows us to, there are venues, there's, as the court is already doing, the word is getting out on Facebook, Twitter, uh, internet. I'm not savvy in all these things. I'm still having to get brought up to speed, but it's been exciting to see our circuits using um, uh, technology to allow citizens and our young people to learn more about the courts and what we do. If you can just tell us uh, a little bit about, well, at least some, uh, about uh, the communication plan as you know it. Yes, Justice LaBarga, I want to uh, first thank you for your vision in having the Judicial Management Council develop a communication plan. Uh, and I was honored that you allowed me to serve as chair so that this plan can be developed. Our uh, committee developed and the, the J Judicial Management Council approved and the full justices also approved a communication plan that is four years uh, um, in the making. Now, the goal of Florida's communication plan is to advance court communication efforts to improve the perception of the judicial branch to both internal and external audiences. The, it allows the court system to improve perceptions and create support for the courts by building relationships with a variety of audiences. It also is to sustain outreach efforts to enhance public understanding and support for the judicial branch. The courts are to also improve internal working communication and have open lines of communication, not only within the court family, but externally, and to communicate effectively using coordinated st strategic efforts. And the communication plan has numerous strategies and ideas in developing um, different plans and different ideas for circuits to, to look to to improve communication internally and externally over the next four years. What do you say, how do you describe the importance of courts to those people sitting in a courtroom? For example, you, you are a trial judge. I haven't been one now for the last nine years, but I was one for 13 years in Palm Beach County, and I always got uh, some really good feedback from people who actually served as jurors and participated in trials somehow. What, what is your feedback as a trial judge here in Leon County as to uh, the importance of courts to people who sit in the courtroom? Justice, I sit in the county court, and it is vital in the county court level in particular where we are dealing with so many pro se litigants. Um, your work uh, with the access to civil justice ties so much in to what I see in the court system. We have citizens who want to have their day in court, who want access, but who may not know how to maneuver through a very complicated legal maze. The uh, court systems must be able to allow citizens to file their pleadings, to have uh, to have their day in court to be heard when they step into the courtroom, to have uh, an opportunity to speak their their cases, whichever side they're on, to have judges pay attention and be fair in their rulings, but to listen, to be very good listeners. 
Uh, it is so important that we do this in order to enhance public trust and confidence. So I take it, uh, Judge Ashenoff and Richardson, that in, in your court, uh, the county court, which many of us describe as the people's court, because we're, that's where people come in to resolve minor disputes, uh, that you see a lot of people coming in who are scared to death uh, and they can't afford a lawyer, uh, and they're standing there in front of you, and you as a judge cannot help them. You cannot walk them through the system because then the other side is going to accuse you of taking sides. So you're in a tough situation. Tell us a little bit about what can you do to help these folks along to the extent that you can. One of the things that the county courts can do, and certainly in our circuit we're doing, is we are conducting, We and this is part of what the communication plan encourages us to do, is to have clinics. For instance, we're having landlord-tenant clinics where with the clerk of court and with uh, attorneys, a panel that is present and explains to both the landlords and the tenants how do you present a a landlord-tenant case and provides vital vital information about the appropriate forms and information about the statute and guides them, uh, those who come to these clinics on a landlord-tenant case. These are often the type of cases where they don't want to hire an attorney. Uh, They can't afford to hire an attorney. The costs are very low uh, in terms of damages. So uh, these clinics are very helpful. Uh, We're also uh, directing people to uh, legal aid foundations. Uh, Legal aid foundations are so helpful to pro se litigants Part of the communication plan encourages us to get that information out handily. Um, Whether we leave these in the clerk of court's office, we are working with our clerks to provide information that is citizen-friendly and referring individuals to resources out there in the community. In my office, I've compiled a resources sheet so that uh, pro se and indigent individuals can get information about resources in their community. The communication plan has several suggestions along this line uh, to connect citizens with resources and improve communication using the 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 court website uh, facebook twitter i've been so impressed with how the supreme court has actually taken a lead in this i'm so excited to see the supreme court sharing information using certainly this podcast uh, as well as uh, twitter feed and facebook um it's been very exciting, and the, and the Supreme Court is taking a leadership role, not only in our state, but I, I believe nationally. But it is absolutely important that if we're going to have a judicial system, that everyone has access to it. I firmly believe that Florida has one of the best judicial systems in the country. Uh, but what is the use in having a great judicial system if only those who can afford it are able to use it? And, and uh, that, that's just not acceptable in a democracy where everybody should have access to the democracy. So one of the things that I, I do want to talk about is, is how do people find out about what we do in courts? Uh, my view, having been a lawyer for 37 years now, and having been in practice as a former prosecutor, former public defender in private practice and as a circuit judge and now as a Supreme Court justice. My, my experience has been that, that when people think of our judicial system, they think of these high-profile cases that we read about in the paper, that we read and um, these big murder cases that, that reporters like to write about. And that hasn't been my experience as a, as a judge sitting on the bench the typical cases that judges hear every day are cases involving our children, our, uh, perhaps uh, our nephews, our nieces, our next-door neighbors, perhaps ourselves, a family member, someone who just fell off the track for one instance and now just needs to get back on track again to continue to be a productive citizen. Uh, but, again, people don't realize that that's what is going on. That's the bulk of the cases we, we're dealing with every day. Those first-degree murder cases of people who commit atrocious crimes, they are the exception. Uh, the other cases involving everyday people, they're the rule. And it is up to judges to deal with these cases on an individual basis. And the goal 
from my perspective, always was, let's get this person back on track again to being a productive citizen rather than just sending him to prison and lock him up for a long time. Uh, uh, you know, to be sure, there are some people who commit crimes that deserve to be locked up for a long time, but that's usually the exception. Uh, do you see that uh, in, in your court, uh, the people who you immediately are able to assess that, well, this is not a bad person, uh, just had a bad day or under some pressure or some mental health issues, perhaps some drug addiction issues. Perhaps if we can get him the right place, uh, maybe we can get him back on track again. Do you see that often in court? Absolutely, Justice. Part of what I love about uh, being on the bench is the opportunity to connect with citizens where they are, uh, whether they have mental health issues, whether they are facing uh, poverty issues or economic issues. It is a challenge that all judges see and feel, and I'm honored to be on the bench to do what I can. Uh, so I am there to administer justice, but at the same time, I'm also there to help in, in the ways that I can. For instance, I currently preside over felony drug court. We're very fortunate in our circuit to have felony drug court where those who are suffering with drug and alcohol issues can get treatment in lieu of incarceration. We're very fortunate in our circuit to have a program like that. We also have mental health court in our circuit, and it's wonderful uh, to see the judge that presides on that bench uh, be able to have those defendants sent into mental health treatment facilities to get the care they need in, in lieu of being in our jails and prisons. So part of what I have learned through the work of the communication plan, part of your leadership, uh, is to make sure that we communicate to our respective communities, to our respective circuits, that we have these resources, that there are resources, that the courts are there to not only administer justice to protect our communities um, from violations of criminal law, but to also have people helped in the ways that we can help and to communicate that uh, the communication plan helps us, for instance, to let citizens know this is what we have, this is the resources that we can connect you with all over the state. I have noticed in the last year when I look at websites from all over the state, circuits are absolutely using websites to share information about drug court, mental health court, veterans court. It's very exciting to see. One thing I I've always uh, tell judges, new judges, about our system is that one powerful way people learn about the importance of courts is through jury service. I'm not sure you see that. And, uh, you know, people may groan when they get the summons to come in and serve as, as jurors, but in my experience, once they're chosen as jurors and they're resolved to the fact that they're going to sit there and listen to this trial, they really get into it. And, and once the case is over and they made a decision, their perspective changes completely. Uh, I always uh, asked jurors after a jury trial, how do you feel about jury service today now that you served? Uh, even in cases where they deliberated for a long time and it was a difficult decision to make, and you can tell that they were, they argued a lot, even then uh, all of them would tell me, that it was the greatest thing they ever did. And they're so happy that they had a chance to do it because now they really understand how our system works. And the one question I would always ask them after that was, well, do you feel that someone sitting at home can make a judgment call about what a judge or a jury did unless they were actually sitting in the courtroom and listened to all the evidence in the case. And if they learned anything from a jury trial was that they cannot, that unless you were there to, to see the witnesses as they testified, hear what they had to say right there in front of you, and if you listen to what the law was, the legislators we elected passed, that they were told to follow, uh, unless you were there for that, you're in no position to judge what a jury does in a case. And and that that is one of the biggest learning tools that we have. It's actually serving on a jury. Uh, and again, every week, 
thousands and thousands of Floridians are summoned throughout the state to serve on juries. And they do serve on juries in civil cases where it could be anything from a real estate case to a medical malpractice case or some type of commercial litigation case uh, to a criminal case where someone can be charged from anything from petty theft all the way out to first-degree murder. Every week, people are summoned to listen to those trials. And and I, I think that people usually leave very impressed with the way we conduct our judicial system. So I, I welcome all those folks who serve on juries and, and hope that they will always continue to do that. My wife has served on two juries. Uh, and uh, she basically was immensely impressed, particularly because I wasn't on the case. Uh, but in any event, she was very impressed with the system, having participated in it from that angle. Uh, that said, about juries, is that pretty much your impression of, of the way people leave the courthouse after jury service? Yes. I believe that jurors are doing an amazing job. They take what they do seriously. They're very thoughtful. They're very considerate of their deliberations, and I see that. Um, I also believe that jurors, when they're initially summoned, aren't always enthusiastic about serving, but they're often reminded that we have men and women who are fighting all over the world for the rights that our respective courthouses represent, and they have the opportunity to do uh, their civic duty right here in their own backyard. And usually that reminds them and that tempers um, their anxiety about being summoned. Uh, the role of the juror is just so important. And I always remind them that without their service, our courts could not function, could not operate. And I, and I agree. And, and uh, the jury, uh, the mere fact that the framers of our Constitution decided that these decisions uh, involving somebody's financial fate or even freedom uh, should be left to uh, jurors of their peers and not just some professional person who makes those decisions. Uh, and that that is one of the brilliant aspects of our constitutional system in this country. Uh, I don't think anyone wants to face a military tribunal in a dictatorship <laughs> when someone is charged with a crime. I came from that world, and, uh, and that's where I was born. I was born in Cuba, and that's the way it was. Uh, and, you know, I... There's a story about when when uh, Fidel Castro took over, uh, the previous uh, regime that was in place, which was a dictatorship, had an air force, such as it was, maybe five or six airplanes. And they were bombing Fidel and his people in the mountains because they were at war with Fidel. Once Fidel won, the, uh, the pilots that were dropping those bombs on Fidel's and Fidel and his army uh, were captured. And they were tried by a tribunal. The tribunal that was in place was a straight shooter one. It's the one that had been in place all along. And the uh, bombers, the, the, the pilots who were dropping bombs, their claim and their defense was that they were in the military, they were at war, and they were following orders. And based on that defense and based on the facts presented, they were acquitted. Fidel didn't like that, so he fired the tribunal, and uh, installed his own tribunal. And within a week, the, uh, the pilots were retried in a very public trial that was televised across the country. They were convicted, and some of them were executed, and some of them served long terms in prison. Uh, so that's what happens when people don't like the results of a judge. You know, they, you know, they, they go off to some very drastic uh, approach to resolving in their own way. And uh, we cannot have that. So that's why we allow jurors, people who are not interested one way or the other in the case to come in and make these decisions. And I think that's the best system. It's not ever going to be perfect, but that's, I cannot think of a better system to do this. Okay, now let's, let's talk a little bit about some of the history that uh, the Supreme Court of Florida has had as far as as uh, as, as uh, 
being innovative in communicating to the people what courts do. I wanted to talk a little bit about the decision that was made in the 1970s to allow cameras in the courtrooms. Television cameras are allowed at the trial court level, at the appellate court level, including the Florida Supreme Court. Uh, And, uh, you know, we have allowed that for a long time. In fact, the oral arguments before the Florida Supreme Court are televised. You can actually access them uh, anytime you want. Uh, They're by case case name, case number, and you're able to get them on your computer. Uh, We've been very open about that. Has, have you had any experience with cameras in your courtroom? Yes, we have had uh, cameras in our courtroom when there are high-profile uh, trials and the media has requested to come in to the courtroom and our court administrator typically coordinates all that. I know that actually our Supreme Court has been a leader nationally. Uh, also, uh, we have so many law schools all over the state that turn to the video, the videos of oral arguments. So, Justice, uh, I, I believe that Florida is a trendsetter on many levels. In the in our courtrooms, we do have uh, media come in, but we are not at the point where we have the live stream of the, um, unless a local channel, a local media outlet has the trial live stream, like the Florida Supreme Court has it. Every oral argument. You can pull it up online, and that's been very exciting. And I still now watch oral arguments from from my office, even now, and I, I find uh, I find that very informative and very helpful. We started a national trend, and at first, uh, you know, we were told that uh, you know you got to be crazy to allow this to happen. Uh, you know, are you kidding? But but still, it, I think it is a, it is a good way for those who cannot fly up to Tallahassee to watch his oral arguments. I I think it's imperative that people get to see how justice is being done. It's not just that justice is done. It has to be seen to be done, and that's the only way that we we arrive at the legitimacy that courts have to begin with, Uh, that people get to see how it happened. And and they may disagree with the decision uh, that we made, and that happens all the time. Uh, and that's pretty much the life of a judge. When you take the bench every day and you got one side arguing for one thing and got the other side arguing exactly against it and you got a rule for one or the other, once you make your rule, you're going to make one side very happy and the other side extremely unhappy. And, but the key is the key is that both sides leave your courtroom thinking that, okay, I lost. I think the judge was wrong, but I think that judge uh, – Actually, Nafi Richardson gave it her all to try to make the best decision possible. And as long as people leave with that, that's about all that we can deliver as, as, as judges. Because we, somebody's got to win, somebody's got to lose. Um, of course, nowadays, in, 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 if you read the papers, uh, the winning sides love what you do. The losing side will call you activist judges. Uh, and that's just the way it's always been. And that's the way it's always going to be. So anyway, that's an, another aspect of, of our dedication to, to public information uh, or to allowing the public to see what we do is the fact that for the last 15 years, every circuit in the state has a dedicated public information officer. Uh, we, we have them all over the, the state, and each circuit is, it makes a good effort to to basically allow people to know what's going on in their courtrooms in the best way possible. Uh, you have a public information officer in your court, don't you? Yes, we have a, we have a public information officer. However, he was a designee of our, of our chief. Um, we're, he's actually a court marshal, Bill Wills, who also wears two hats. He's our court marshal and he's our public information officer. But because of this communication plan, he has actually created a communication committee in the Second Circuit. We're working on implementing this four-year plan. So even our marshal has become involved in implementing communication plan, also court, uh, courthouse safety. We, we're blending all of that into the work that we're doing. I want to also compliment um, 
you've got an amazing team chief, uh, Craig Waters. Um, he has been wonderful in ta- in developing and getting the word out about the court communication plan. I also learned in working on this uh, communication plan that there's a statewide organization of the Florida uh, Public Information Officers. I didn't know this, that there's a whole statewide organization. I know that you spoke to them after the court communication plan was developed and, and approved by the, the, by the full um, Supreme Court, and they were so excited to take this plan and run with it. And I just wanted to sh- kind of send a shout out to them how appreciative our committee is that they are running with this. They took your message when you spoke with them and they really are working on helping circuits. For instance, how do you prepare a press release? That may sound basic to them, but many of our chief judges who don't have professional PIO officers, they don't know how to handle um, many communication issues. So the the uh, statewide PIO officers and leaders are actually working with circuits and providing them hands-on assistance, and I can't thank them enough. The fact that our circuits are not alone. There are teams of people that are there to help our chief judges and other stakeholders in developing and implementing the court communication plan. We do not want, our committee does not want to see this plan sitting on any one shelf. And I agree with you 1,000%. So let me just move on to another topic. Uh, when, when it comes to effective communication, Hollywood knows a thing or two. And I'm always struck by how many great movies are set in courtrooms. I'm talking about dramas, tragedies, thrillers, comedies, even musicals. We even had a movie film here in, at, at the Florida Supreme Court, but that's a topic for another podcast, and I'll just leave that sitting out there for you. So what, what would you say, Judge, is, is your, favorite, uh, your favorite court movie? Well, Justice, I believe it's the same as yours, which is To Kill a Mockingbird. Is that yours as well? That, that, is, that is my favorite movie of all time, and I, I think I see it every year. I have it at home, and the book, I think I read it since I was a child, probably 15, 20 times. And I, I've always fancied myself after Atticus Finch, you know, as he stood there in front of that jury, this all-white uh, uh, man, male jury, presiding over the case over a black man in Alabama being charged with the very atrocious crime, having assaulted a white woman. And my my favorite part is during closing arguments where he could, Atticus could see that he was getting nowhere with this jury. They all had their arms crossed and just looking at him, uh, not in a good way. And he tried quoting Thomas Jefferson about how you know, all men in those days, all men are created equal. And that that didn't go very well. And in the sense of his aspiration, you know, he took off his glasses in the movie. He was wiping them with his handkerchief. And he's, he's just trying to buy time not to say the wrong thing. He finally comes out and says, you know, if there's one thing in our system that is the great equalizer, it is our judicial system. It is our courts. Where, where at Rockefeller can be the same as a poor person, where everybody is treated equally. And today you are the court. Today you're here. Today you are the equalizer. And you, that set the tone. It didn't work, but it set the tone for the whole trial. And I found that to be so impressive. And I had that in my book, my, my copy of To Kill a Mockingbird that's been read about a, you know how many times and I have it marked, and I always quote that, that particular statement in, in most of my speeches when I talk to people about our court system, how Atticus Finch was fake, even though he was a fictitional character, but he could have been a hundred real people, people like Thurgood Marshall, and uh, who came down to the South and defended these folks. Uh, some of them were hung. Um, but, you know, to his credit, in some instances, he actually got him off. And a lot of people know 
Thurgood Marshall because he was a United States Supreme Court justice. But people forget that before he was that, he was also one heck of a trial lawyer. And to come down from New York, where he lived, into the Deep South and stand before very, 12 very angry white jurors uh, and actually convince them to acquit a black man charged with a crime back in those days, uh, that was one heck of a feast. And uh, he was excellent at that. So To Kill a Mockingbird was my favorite. Uh, if we want to get light about it, my cousin Vinny uh, is is my second favorite, and I think you and I can agree, Judge, that when we were lawyers trying cases, that all of us at least once in our career faced a judge very similar to the one that cousin Vinny faced, and uh, and the whole business about uh, what are youths and and uh, are you on drugs? Uh, the whole nine yards, I I. You know, I, I can just hear the one judge I'm thinking about that I practice in front of in Palm Beach County as a young prosecutor saying that kind of thing right now, back in the early 80s. Uh, so have you had any judges like, like the, the judge in My Cousin Vinny? I, I have. I have because like you, I, I'm uh, an immigrant and sometimes uh, uh, I speak different. I know when I was practicing here, I would often be asked, "Are you a Yankee?" Because uh, I don't have a Southern drawl, and I would, and and so practicing in the South, I would get called out on having been brought up in New York and Massachusetts, and maybe not having a Southern drawl. But like you, Justice, I Atticus Finch was to me such a role model of the kind of lawyer that I wanted to be. I admired his courage because, in the face of a community that had a strongly differing viewpoint. He stood squarely on the rule of law, and and I believe that that is what makes this country great, that lawyers have moved our country forward because we we have to stand squarely on the rule of law, even where the community may be against um, the rule of law. We have to move our society forward, and I believe that lawyers and judges have played a vital role in that, and I wanted to be part of that. I wanted to be part of the I want to be a member of the, of the bar because to me, when you fight w- with the rule of law to, to make our communities better, to make lives better, that is the place to be. And Atticus Finch represented that courage, that courageous lawyer, the lawyer that, that did the right thing because the rule of law demanded it. And, and to some extent, that, that transfers to judges. Uh, the, the judge that is presently uh, being considered for the United States Supreme Court. Uh, his name is as Gossage. Mm-hmm. Uh, he made a statement uh, during his presentation that that I thought was was very good about judges. And he said, uh, you know, a good judge doesn't like a lot of his own rulings because the rulings is going against the grain of how he feels about things. But he's following the law, or she's following the law. And that's the sign of a good judge, where you know, gee, I wish I didn't have to rule this way. You know, I wish I could just, because I just know it's not the way to go with this, but this is what the law requires of me. And and that is the sign of a good judge. And, and, and God knows you and I have done that so many times, where we just follow the law. So anyway, uh, I've enjoyed this. Very, very much, uh, and I, I suspect that uh, that we're going to have many more of these podcasts. Uh, and each time we have one, I learn something new. Uh, and I hope that you'll come back. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Bench. The mission of Florida's courts is to protect rights and liberties, uphold and interpret the law, and provide for the peaceful resolution of disputes. To fulfill this mission, courts need the trust of the people they serve. These podcasts are designed to strengthen your confidence in Florida's courts by increasing your understanding of them. We hope you join us again.